Welcome to What is Going Om for new thought from the edge of Om. Each week on Om Times flagship radio show, veteran broadcaster, author, and media consultant Sandy Sedgbeer conducts thought provoking interviews with inspirational authors, artists, musicians, scientists, speakers, and filmmakers who are working at the point where spirituality and science meet consciousness at the very edge of Om. Here is your host, Sandy Sedgbeer. Hello and welcome. What happens when we die is a mystery that's plagued humanity since the beginning of time. The idea that this is all there is and then we're gone is not something most of us can or really want to get our heads around. Such was the case for businessman Mark Ireland, who, despite being exposed to mediumship from an early age, as the son of Richard Ireland, a deeply spiritual minister and renowned psychic medium to the stars, chose the more conventional path of pursuing mainstream success. Until, that is, the sudden unexpected loss of his youngest son, Brandon, plunged him into the spiritual world of psychics and mediums in search of messages from the afterlife. And he discovered remarkable proof of life after death. Mark Ireland joins me now to share his journey from pragmatic businessman to founder of an organization that helps parents heal and the author of two groundbreaking books, Soul Shift, Finding Where the Dead Go and Persis The Persistence of the Soul, Mediums, Spirit Visitations and Afterlife Communication. Mark Ireland, welcome. Thank you, Sandy. I appreciate you having me on today. Mark, I imagine that you see your life as kind of divided into two distinct parts, before and after Brendan's passing. Yeah, that's very true. I think um, that was a catalyst to kind of shake me out of uh, just doing this mundane <laughs> path down the business world and trying to advance my career and focusing extensively on that back into the world that my dad was in his field um, really as, as it's turned out to carry on his legacy in many ways and let people know about him uh, because he was kind of lost to history in a way and then to do some other work in in line with spiritual means and and things where uh, I could help other people it's interesting isn't it when we think we've got our life mapped out for us and then something happens and something completely different turns up. Before we talk about Brendan's passing and your plunge into this world of, um, you know, psi phenomena, if you like, as well as uh, afterlife communication, tell us a little bit about your father because he was a famous psychic medium. He was also a minister. He counseled stars such as uh, Mae West and Glenn Ford and even the Eisenhower family. What was it like growing up in such a, I would imagine, an unusual family like that? It was actually normal to me because I didn't know anything different. It was my friends that thought it was really unusual. But dad pretty much knew what was going on all the time. You couldn't get away with a lot. <laughs> uh, my, older, my older brother, when he was a teenager, you know, my father uh, thwarted his efforts to get beer when he was underage and to drag race his car and all these kinds of things. Uh, when my parents were first married, my mom had um, attempted to become a vegetarian for a couple of months. And then one day she broke down and went out for a hamburger. And when dad came home that night, the first words out of his mouth were, so surely did you enjoy your hamburger today? <laughs> so that's what it was like. But the other part of that was seeing his demonstrations connect um, both with psychic phenomena and the spirit communication, the mediumship piece coming through at different times. He did more of that in the church. Um, and more of the psychic phenomena in public venues and on TV shows. Because back in that era, you know, the 60s and 70s and early 80s, that's really what was, it was had to be packaged more as entertainment for mainstream audiences. But from a young age, I saw, when I saw the spirit communication come through, that was my very favorite thing. Because although the psychic stuff was really compelling and undeniable. It was uh, the messages that he bring through with high degree of specificity and pertinence to the sitter. And I could see the sitter's reactions, um, tears welling up and tears of joy, you know. And I thought to myself, you know, there really is more, you know, there's more than just this physical existence. And we're, 
consciousness isn't just the brain. There's more to the mind than the brain. It's a filter of consciousness is what I've come to the conclusion of. But um, from a young age, I, I knew that. And, you know, fast forward to when my son passed, that was a, an immense help to me. Um, now, my dad, he, I think where this was first discovered, I spoke to my grandmother years ago about this, and she first noticed signs of this in him at, as early as age three, when they lived in rural Ohio with no telephone or anything. And he would say, Grandpa's coming. And within a certain period of time, Grandpa would be there. And they got to the point where they, she'd cook meals based on when my dad said Grandpa was coming. And then at age five, he had corrective surgery on his eyes at the Columbus, Ohio Children's Hospital because he was born cross-eyed. After that surgery had taken place, he had his eyes cupped in bandage. He was tied down to a bed because they were afraid that he'd mess with the bandages. So this one nurse felt sorry for him and uh, said, I'll let you up if you promise not to mess with the bandages. He agreed. She went on about her rounds, came back, found him bouncing the ball against the wall and catching it, thinking that he'd removed the bandages, but he hadn't. That was even more disturbing probably for her. And then she pulled in some doctors to observe this. And then they tried some different tests on him, like voice throwing, putting him in a bed, having <clears throat> one doctor said, stand in front of him and another at a doorway and asking who was in front of him and he would get that right. So that was kind of the early discovery of these abilities in my father from my grandparents. And then uh, he, he actually sat in a circle at the age of 13 and gave messages to people. Um, that was, I guess, his first public demonstration per se. And then by the time he was uh, 17, 18, he became a trans medium in addition to the other things. And then he was, um, he was ordained by the uh, National Spiritualist Association of Churches in the U.S., and worked for them as a traveling minister for a number of years. And then by 1960, he founded his own in, interdenominational or non-denominational church in Phoenix, Arizona, called the University of Life. And then he branched into, you know, secular venues, demonstrating all over the place and on TV. He really felt like he wanted to reach the mainstream audiences because he could possibly open their minds and make them think, you know, more broadly if they saw something compelling. So that's kind of the backdrop on my father. So you didn't want to follow him, though. Did you feel that you just couldn't because you didn't have that skill? Or was it you just wanted a completely different life? I think, first off, um, my father always said I was very psychic. And I've had episodes of it pop through. <clears throat> I think the thing was, I, we're two different people, you know? I think who wants to be their parent anyhow? <laughs> but... I'm, I've been a more analytical, more careful, pragmatic type of person where he was more carefree, live for the moment um, type of personality. So we're just different people. Um, and I also looked at his abilities and I can't measure up to that. I mean, um, look at, you know, do you want to be Michael Jordan's son, you know, or whatever and try and play basketball? So it's, it's kind of that thing to an extent. Um, and because my interests were different, I just went down that more conventional path. I always appreciated my dad's gift. I would take friends to see him. I'd want, you know, I'm, um, I was proud of him and, and all those kinds of things. I just never sought to be the next version mm -hmm. of him. So tell us what happened um, when Brandon passed and, you know, how that motivated you to investigate and write about mediumship. It was one particular morning. He was 18 years old. It was a January day, January 10th. So we're actually coming up on the anniversary in just six days. But um, that morning he had mentioned to me he was going to go on a hike with his buddies to the, in the McDowell Mountains in Scottsdale, Arizona, where our home was at the time. And I had now he hiked there a lot. But this morning I had this strange premonition. So we talked about my dad's ability. And here's one of those instances I had where I felt the strong premonition or presence there that made me feel uneasy about his hike and that it could be very dangerous, possibly take his life. And then my analytical side took over. I just said, oh, you're just being a worrying parent. But when it came time for him to leave, I did ask him not to go and said, Brandon, please don't go. And his last words to me were, we're going, dad. Just like, stop your worrying, you know? And he was 18, so it would have been a little manipulative of me to try and do anything more than that to keep him. And it was later that day, we were on the other end of town at the time, and I got a distress call. We came back, and within a short period of time, we saw a crowd of spectators at the base of the mountain, fire truck, ambulance, and helicopter, and I was informed by a chaplain that he had passed. And that was 
the lowest point in my life. Um, no matter what you know or what you believe, that pain, that immediate shock of knowing that you're not going to see him in a physical form again, and he's not going to be in your house in a physical form, and, and you're not going to see him grow up and go to college and get married and have kids is a huge shock. But I will say that um, what I recall from my childhood and seeing my dad and those things helped me immensely. And we, my wife and I healed much faster than most. most. And then there was a series of synchronistic events and um, experiences that started happening that really pulled me back into my dad's field almost immediately. I'd say that the first one was within a day or two, I wanted a direct form of connection. And so I, uh, I went into a darkened walk-in closet, sat down and tried to meditate, quieted my mind. And with a short, within a short period of time, I saw an image of Brandon's face scroll by in my mind's eye and it was smiling. I felt joy and it was radiant. It was actually glowing. And then right after that was a symbol, a cross with an oval loop at the top. At the time, I didn't know what that meant. Um, I'd seen them, but I didn't know what it symbolized. So then after I was done, I went and Googled it to find out that it was an Ankh, the oldest cross of human history dating back about 5,000 years or so with the lower portion representing physical life, the oval loop representing eternal life. So what I got, what I felt was a coded message telling me my son was joyful and he was in eternal life. Had I known what that symbol meant, I would have said, oh, maybe my subconscious mind is just trying to make me feel better. But because I got that, it, it really was helpful. And then about day three, I was in the mortuary. And by that point, my father had been gone for about 12 years, but I had an uncle, his brother, who had similar abilities. And I had asked him a few days earlier if he could get anything to please let me know. Now, at this point, we didn't know Brandon's cause of death. No one would really speculate. His buddy had just said that Brandon complained about his arms being somewhat numb and a rapid heartbeat, but we really didn't know anything else. The authorities hadn't speculated at all. So on day three, my uncle and I connect by cell phone while I'm in, or mobile, I guess you would say, um, while I'm in the mortuary. And he, he said, Mark, I tried to connect last night and I, I couldn't connect at all. But this morning I was doing my morning meditation and your dad came to me. He wanted you to know that he was there for Brandon when Brandon um, transitioned. Brandon was somewhat confused at the beginning, but your dad helped him understand what was going on in the just. Brandon wanted you to know that you were the best parents he ever could have had, which is the nice, the fuzzy thing we like to hear. But then he gave me the piece of evidence. He said, your dad said Brandon's death was caused by a lack of oxygen in his bloodstream that caused his heart to fail. And then two days later, I got a call from the physician who had conducted the autopsy. And she told me that Brandon died due to a severe asthma attack that drove down his blood oxygen levels, causing cardiac arrest. So my uncle gave me the cause of death two days before the autopsy results were revealed. And so those were kind of the first two things that happened. And then from there, there were a lot of synchronistic things that came into place that really took me down this path. Why did you, I mean, you didn't really need convincing you you had this background and this proof from your father so why did you what made you then follow this path and start doing your own research and inquiry well it started with not just wanting evidence but the sense of connection with my son um that to know we're not disconnected i guess i would say even though he's now in another realm i wanted that sense of direct connection uh, so that was important. And that was a big part of the healing process, too. Um, and then I felt initially like I thought I needed to put my energy into something constructive and spiritual. So I started down the path of actually doing a biography on my father because I wanted to bring his legacy to life and keep it going. And I got uh, I had hired a, an editor from New York City and I got so much written. But like the, the foreword to the book was really kind of what I just explained to you, like these things that had happened. And after reading that, and then she went into the material I had of my father, she said, you know, Mark, you could write this biography on your dad anytime, but I think you have your own story to tell, and I think you have your own path to take. And so that that was kind of when things unfolded. And um, three weeks after Brandon passed, I was watching a news excerpt on a local TV station, and it showed this research being conducted at the University of Arizona involving mediums. So I was pretty surprised to see something like this on mainstream TV to begin with. And then uh, they had the medium feature was Alison Dubois, 
before the network show Medium came out. Um, and she was separated from the sitters and she had to give them readings um, based on questions provided to her by a proxy researcher. And I was really impressed because she was giving specific information and then they debriefed with the sitters at the end and uh, turned out that, you know, what she had said was right on target. So I thought to myself, gee, I would really like to have a reading from her or a sitting, I guess you could also call it. Um, and I'd love to be in that lab someday. Well, little did I know that both of those things would transpire. The very next day, I got a call from a man named Jerry Concer who had known my father. And he said, hey, Mark, I know what you've been through and I know someone who might be able to help you. Her name's Allison Dubois and here's a phone number you can call for a reading. So I thought, okay, dad, thank you. <laughs> I set up an appointment with her, and then within a year, I was in that uh, lab actually as a sitter for a test with another medium that was recorded for a Discovery Channel episode. But eight months later, I met with Allison Dubois. Two weeks before that, um, a man who knew my father gave me a box, and inside the box was a bunch of eight and a half by 11 typewritten pages. And on the title page, it said, Your Psychic Potential, A Guide to Psychic Development by Richard Ireland. So I asked this fellow, I said, well, where'd you get this? He goes, well, your dad gave it to me for safekeeping when just before he passed. I said, um, and he said, because you were out of state at the time. I said, well, um, you've had it for 12 years. Why are you giving this to me now? And he says, I don't know. I just feel like I'm supposed to. Two weeks later, I have the reading with Alison Dubois. And she's one of the first things she says to me is she says, I have your father here. And he showed me a book, but I believe it's his book but he's handing it over to you to take forward. Does that make sense to you? And I'm like, yeah, I think I know what that means. And I was subsequently able to get that book published. But um, those are some of the things that, that took place, you know, and there was a spontaneous, I don't want to just ramble on here, but there was a pretty spontaneous direct connection that happened too, involving my wife that, I'll, that I'd like to touch on that, that I think um, tells you that it wasn't just through mediums, there was a lot of different phenomena going was, on. Was uh, the research that was being done at um, Arizona, was that with Gary Schwartz? Yes, at the time it was Schwartz, um, and he's doing other things now. But uh, Dr. Julie Beischel, who did work there, she has a pharmacology PhD. She started the Windbridge Research Center in Tucson, and she's kind of carried forth the mediumship work, even to a, a, a more stringent degree in terms of quintuple blind tests and she's had articles written in different uh, scientific journals and things. So yeah, that's where it was done. Yeah. yeah. Persistence of the soul presents some very detailed accounts of experiments conducted to obtain evidence um, of the continuity of consciousness. Can you share some of the more compelling evidence with us? Yeah. Um, there's, you know, I've had some of my own cases like, um, the, at the very first chapter, I talk about um, Deborah Martin, who's a friend of mine, who's a medium. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the older research that's been done that was documented. <clears throat> but uh, Deborah Martin, um, I was scheduled to go see her one afternoon because she felt she was getting messages from my father about his book, Your Psychic Potential, because I was about to get it published. And she wanted to give me guidance regarding the Ford, which I was writing. Um, and the funny thing was, before I even got there, I got the feeling that I was supposed to make sure that people knew that that book was intended for people who were pursuing this for the right reasons. And by right reasons, I meant not for their own ego or for notoriety, but to be of service. That's really the bottom line. And so I had pre-written a lot of this forward material. Um, so I was going to go see her this afternoon, that one afternoon, but before going that morning, I got a distress call or email from a coworker in another city, Sacramento, California. And she told me that her brother had just died in a motorcycle accident. She didn't know what to do. She had read my first book and knew about my interest in this and was just kind of reaching out for help. And I said, Hey, I'm tied up right now, but I'll get back to you later. So I started driving to Deborah's and I called my friend Linda on the phone and she just said, yeah, my, my brother, he was in a motorcycle accident. He died instantly um, and he left behind some kids. And that's all she told me. And then I arrived at Deborah's house and I'm like, hey, um, it's kind of ironic. I'm here today, at the home of a medium because a friend of mine's brother just died. And she said, well, it's no accident that you're here because um, I'm supposed to you know, talk to her. I said, well, do you want to call her right now? And she said, no, let's do what we came here to do first. And then I'll then we'll see what I can do. 
so we had had a chat about the Ford and pretty much what I had thought was exactly what she was telling me, you know, what she felt like my dad was conveying to her that the sacred nature of that book um, was, it was important to share that. So the people that wanted that training were doing it for the right reasons. Then I said, well, do you want to call Linda now? And she goes, I, I have to pick up my daughter. So I don't have time to give her a reading right now, but let's sit down and see what I can get. So I sat in one chair, she sat in another, she had a notepad and she said, well, what was the brother's name? And I said, I don't know. She goes, what's your friend's name? I said, Linda. And within just seconds, she said, well, this involved a motorcycle accident. Um, he died instantly. So he wants her to know that he didn't suffer any pain. Um, and he's talking about the little kids, the little kids, um, something about them. And then, and then she said something about, and there's a little boy that was like separate from the, the little kids. There was a boy. And she had mentioned something about a red ribbon or banner that she thought went over his casket. So she gave me a number of things like this. And I didn't know if any of them were true other than about the motorcycle accident. And so I called Linda on my drive back and I shared, you know, that. And she was stunned and she felt somewhat relieved. And I said, well, there's something about little kids. Um, oh, and also she had mentioned something about bath time or a bathtub associated with the little kids. And she said for a number of years, her brother had been fighting drug addiction. And so she and her husband had actually taken the kids in and they were literally called the little kids. And their favorite activity was bath time and they would have these water wars in the bathtub. So that was highly relevant. She said the little boy was a grandson that was just born and he was not one of the little kids. He was a, uh, from a different, uh, I don't know if it was a different child, but uh, not the same grouping of the little kids. And it turned out that the red ribbon had indeed been over his casket. It was a gift from his motorcycle buddies. So then what I call this is what I've heard is referred to as like a drop in. So basically it's when a medium gets messages for someone other than the sitter. So you can't allege telepathy with me because I didn't know all that stuff. All I knew about was the motorcycle wreck. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, she then later connected with Linda by phone and gave her the rest of the reading and identified a lot of other really pertinent pieces of information uh, that pizza was his favorite food. Uh, she, he thanked his sister for changing the music at his funeral because they were going to play country Western, which he hated and he wanted hard rock because that's what he liked. So they switched that and uh, the phrase live, love and laugh, which is common now, but back then this was 15 years ago. Or so um, I, I didn't ever hear that phrase, but live, love and laugh it was brought up. Well, that was a phrase that she recently hung on her wall in remembrance of him. And she was about to get a, a tattoo as a memorial to him called, that was going to say live, love and laugh. And it went on and on from there. But she did a phenomenal job. And I think the most impressive part of that was that, you know, she gave me messages that I could not relate to, and I had to relay those. So I essentially served as a proxy sitter for that process. Mm. Um, you also, um, in the book, you write about an experiment that you conducted with your dying sister. That's correct. Um, real, real briefly, though, I was going to just touch on the work done by the SPR going way back. But there, there um, some of the most compelling evidence involved fragmented messages that went to different mediums all over the world that meant nothing individually until pulled together. They were like the pieces of a puzzle that formed a mosaic. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what most psychical researchers and parapsychologists view as the best evidence today. But what I did with my sister, I was kind of a novel approach. I had read a book by Alan Spraggett years ago about uh, Arthur Ford, the man who talked with the dead. And from that, I read about, the whole Houdini code. So Harry Houdini, as most people know, was a famous magician, uh, early 20th century. And initially he was interested in spiritualism and the idea of life after death, but he got discouraged after having, I guess, a bad reading or whatever, or a couple readings that he felt didn't, weren't evidential to him. Maybe he just went to people that weren't that good. I don't know. But then he kind of got angry and became a debunker. So he was trying to debunk mediums, but he also got caught terms of setting people up where he had actually tried to make them look like fakes too. So he, his credibility went down a bit, but before he died, this showed that he still had an interest in this whole concept because he had made an agreement with his wife, Beatrice, um, 
to, he gave her a secret code phrase and said, if anyone gives you this phrase after I'm gone, you'll know that it's Harry Houdini. So um, it was a short period of time after this that medium Arthur Ford came forth with to Beatrice and shared the free secret phrase. He got it. I believe it was called Rosabelle Believe. And so she was overjoyed. Um, it made the New York Times, the headlines. But within a few days, these debunkers were coming out of the woodwork saying, well, you must have been in cahoots with, with his wife, you know, and you guys just wanted the media, the presence uh, and the notoriety from this. Um, or some other would say, oh, a bunch of people probably knew what this was. So if you read about it today, it'll say it's never been solved, but it actually was. And I, it just sounded to me like Arthur Ford was railroaded. <laughs> But I thought to myself, well, what was wrong with this um, approach? And I really came up with two things. I thought, well, first off, the fact that any living person knew what the phrase was, you could always allege that they spilled the beans and they said what it was to someone else. It was shared. And I thought also because somebody knew it, you could allege telepathy with that person that, OK, it isn't really communication with a discarnate person. You're communicating telepathically with this living person. And my sister at the time had developed cancer, pancreatic cancer that metastasized to her liver and she was running short on time. I thought, you know, it would be really a tribute to her and maybe help other people if um, we could conduct a, a test or an experiment that was successful that we could share with folks and, and that might prove evidence. So I thought if she wrote a, wrote a note or a phrase and put it in a sealed envelope that was not opened until we got messages back from mediums, that would dispel um, the idea that somebody spilled the beans and it, they couldn't say that it was telepathy with me because I didn't know, nor would any other person know what it was. So I presented the idea to my sister. She wanted to do it and we did it. So she um, wrote a secret phrase, put it into an envelope. And then I reached out to a couple of friends of mine, Trisha J. Robertson, who is the, uh, she was the president of the Scottish Society of Psychical Research and also Dr. Don Watson, who he's deceased now, but, um, or he's passed on transition. <laughs> um, he's a neuroscientist and he was very interested in this field. So he helped me to devise some protocols for how to conduct the experiment. And we did reach out to probably a, a dozen or so mediums, got back a variety of messages. I don't want to give away the, the finale to the chapter. It's pretty interesting read. It kind of, I think it's pretty intriguing uh, for all the things that, that happen along the way. I will say, you know, as we were getting these messages back, a lot of them, I could tell they were like totally correlated to my sister. I uh, remember one medium said Little House on the Prairie, which was one of my sister's favorite shows. Another um, said Arizona, where my sister lived, but he was from Scotland and he had no idea who, he, who this was about. Um, uh, there was another that said, I have my teeth back, but my sister had lost some teeth. So those kinds of things were very intriguing and made me feel like, okay, we're perhaps on the right path here. But uh, but that's how that experiment was conducted. It was really interesting. And I think if anyone who is a researcher or even just interested and wants to do an informal um, experiment of their own, they can read that and kind of learn from it, you know, what worked well, what could be improved on if they wanted to try something a little bit different. Mm. We're going to take a short break now, Mark. You're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and my guest today is mediumship investigator and co-founder of the worldwide organization Helping Parents Heal, Mark Island. And we're talking about evidence for the survival of consciousness after death, as explored in his groundbreaking books, Soul Shift, Finding Where the Dead Go, and The Persistence of the Soul, Mediums, Spirit Visitations, and Afterlife Communication. We'll be back with more from Mark Ireland in a few moments. Stay tuned. Home Times TV. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust spheric approach. Ohm Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. 
Through our produced shows, OM Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an OM Times magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on OM Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive OM Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. OM Times, open yourself to the possibilities. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of OM Times flagship radio show, What is Going On? And as an author, editor, and 13 times book judge, who's read thousands of books and interviewed hundreds of authors, I'm constantly asked, what's really worth reading and what's not? So I created the No BS Spiritual Book Club to help you save time and money by picking the brains of discerning names who have walked this path before you. There's no catch, no fees, and no BS. Just an ever-growing library of 10 best spiritual book lists from some of your favorite authors and teachers, plus free book excerpts, audios, and video interviews with people like Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., David G., Lee Harris, Mark Nepo, and more. From well-known classics to hidden gems you've never heard of, it's the only no BS guide to the best spiritual books to enlighten your journey of self-discovery. So why not join the club? Get inspired and save money at the nobsspiritualbookclub.com. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Welcome back. Mark Ireland, your father wasn't just um, you know, an incredible medium. He was also uh, known for his precognitive skills, and he made many successful predictions. Do you think that precognition goes hand in hand with mediumship? I think there's a wide array of phenomena that are associated with psychic uh, psi phenomena. Um, and I think we try and assign words to things sometimes that are very abstract and we don't know where one starts or the other ends. But um, I think if you looked at his abilities, he, he probably was somewhat telepathic. I have some evidence of that from uh, feedback I've received from people. It's definitely clairvoyant, clairaudient, um, and, um, and also precognitive. So I think it's just some people may have more ability in one area than another. Um, and some, like my dad, had a, the full array of abilities. But I think it does tie in. And, and then mediumship, I think, is most of the people I know in the field have defined it as telepathy with the deceased. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, but I think there's other ways of getting that that uh, information too, uh, whether you could define it as tele telep telepathy or like clairvoyance, seeing images in your mind hearing voices, whether they're auditory or just ideas popping into your own mind. Um, and I've had some of these experiences myself, even though I'm not like a practicing psychic or medium. Um, so I have a feel for what it can be like. I can't really describe what my father's, how he um, encountered it in his own way. But um, I think a lot of those abilities tie together, yes. So you wouldn't call yourself a medium per se. You don't practice. I'm not a practicing medium. I haven't really worked to develop it. I mean, I've done some tests with people just to test myself, just kind of for fun or, or see what I've got. And I, I surprised myself, you know, with uh, the accuracy of some of the information I was able to bring through uh, once in a public venue. <laughs> but um, I have not really sought that out. And at this point, too, you've read my work. I'm trying to be more journalistic in my approach. So the minute I say, OK, now I'm a medium, um, I'm putting up my flag and, you know, then I, I kind of lose the ability to, to have that objective perspective mm -hmm. that I think I have right now that people would value. Who knows? Maybe someday, maybe when I retire uh, from my day job and, and everything else, I'll, I'll consider that. But for right now, I'm not doing that. It's also a huge responsibility to read for grieving people because they're very vulnerable. And that's part of the reason uh, that I put together a mediumship certification program, because 
uh, after Soul Shift came out, I had so many people coming to me asking for references for uh, qualified mediums. At the time, I knew a handful, but a lot of them were booked way out or some of them charged a lot because they were well known. And so I thought to myself, there have to be other people with these abilities that are just lesser known. And that's proven to be true. Yes. And, you know, it's um, I think it's very necessary because it mm. is one of the arenas that attracts all kinds of, you know, um, people call it fraudulent people, you know, scammers. Um, we all want to know this, but at the same time, we just can't allow ourselves to believe it. It's tough. I think we, we get so accustomed to living in a physical body and everything we touch is physical and, you know, the sounds and sights and everything else um, that it, it, it's hard to get to that point unless you've had a personal experience. I mean, you could read a lot about it and that can help you get most of the way there. But I think what really will trip somebody is if they've had a direct personal experience, be it through a medium that gives a high, highly compelling reading, whether it's through a dream visit with a deceased loved one or some other direct experience. Um, one that I wanted to share with you occurred, this is going back to my son's passing, but two weeks after he passed, the first intuitive I spoke with, I wouldn't really call her a medium, but she said, I think within six months, you're gonna see Brandon and he's gonna be at the side of your bed. Well, six months later, we went on a cruise and it was initially scheduled to be at the celebration of Brandon's High school graduation but since he had passed we took our older son and brandon's best buddy Stu, who had been the one trying to resuscitate him on the mountain before leaving though um, a friend of ours james linton who was a musician and a composer uh, asked to borrow brandon's bass guitar which you can see directly in the middle there behind mm -hmm. me that blue the blue body bass and um turned out he was he had a in-home studio and he was going to do some recording but he didn't have a bass so we said sure you can borrow it we go on this trip, we're gone for a week, we come back. The day we get back, my wife's sitting at the foot of our bed and she suddenly feels a presence near her and she sees it as a shadow figure out of her peripheral vision. And she knows in intuitively it's Brandon. So this is a very joyous thing for her. And then she told me about it, I was really excited. The very next day, James Linton, the musician calls Susie and he says, Susie, I've got something to tell you but I don't know how to share this with you. And she thought he was going to say, oh, well, the, I broke the bass guitar, but it wasn't that at all. He said, well, I was in the studio recording the song and suddenly I felt another presence in there with me. And I, I saw a shadow figure out of my peripheral vision and I saw flashes of white light and I thought I was hallucinating. So I, I took a shower, I drank water, I got something to eat. But each time I came back, it got stronger and stronger. And he says, finally, I just said, Brandon, what do you want? And then he said he felt guided to read the lyrics of the baseline of the song. At the end of it, he said, this is the best song I've ever written, but I didn't write it. Uh, it's called The Other Side. So I thought that was pretty compelling with or without the song. The mere fact that he had an identical experience to my wife the next day with no knowledge of her experience. Mm, yeah. Yeah. There are some very convincing stories. Tell me, um, how does your... Um, medium certification program work i mean you're not training mediums you're basically testing no. them in a way and putting them through their paces right. aren't you yeah so i'm not trying to be like a wing bridge or um the university of virginia where i'm testing to get journal articles published or anything mine is a more practical reason and it's just to give people vetted resources that they can trust I'm doing it as a public service. I don't make anything on it. I don't charge anything. I do not get a share of anything that the mediums um, charge. That's up to them. Um, I just put together the testing protocols, do the testing, and then feature the ones who pass on a, on a website. And what it involves is a process that I developed after talking to Dr. Emily Williams Kelly at the University of Virginia Division of Perceptual Studies. I was a test sitter for a program she did a number of years ago there that's the same organization or division in the University of Virginia that Ian Stevenson founded many years ago for reincarnation research that's now being conducted by Jim Tucker. And Dr. Bruce Grayson, who's done all the near-death experience research, is also in that department. So Dr. Kelly told me a little bit about what her protocols were, and I kind of mirrored them to some degree. And then I went to Tricia Robertson at the SSPR that I mentioned earlier, and she helped me refine them. And so what I've gotten to to this point, and I've actually raised the bar about three or four times since I started this in 2014. So 
this spring, it'll have been 10 years I've been doing this and I've certified 41 people thus far. They have to go through five blind readings via Zoom with no video. They don't know who they're gonna be reading for until the reading starts. And then they only are given a first name. So with the video off, um, at least until the latter portion of the, the session. Uh, the sessions are recorded and then later transcribed. And then the sitter has to grade them, basically breaking um, statements individual um, into individual statements. So it could be like a paragraph work of information has to be broken into individual statements that could be graded as either correct, incorrect, or indeterminable. Indeterminable might be a prediction that hasn't happened yet or piece of information that the sitter can't find out because it involves someone they don't know and don't know where they live. Um, and then if there's a highly compelling piece of information, the sitter can award, award bonus points. And there's two degrees of that. There's a two point bonus and a five point bonus. So let's say that the, the medium says to the sitter, I believe I have a, a son here from on the other side. I believe you have a son that's passed and he's given me a first initial A and I think that he liked pizza. Um, okay, so let's say the sitter says, yes, I had a son pass, that's correct. Uh, first letter A, his name is Aaron, so that's right. Um, he didn't get, they didn't get the whole name, so I'll give that a two point bonus. And pizza was actually his favorite food, so I'll give you two point bonus for that too. Now, let's just say that instead the medium says, okay, I think I have a son here who passed. I think his name was Aaron. And um, his favorite food was pepperoni and bell pepper pizza. And then the, the, the sitter says, yes, I had a son pass. That's correct. Um, his name was Aaron. So that's five point bonus in addition to being correct. And his favorite food was that exact pizza. So I'm going to give you five point bonus for that. So as you can see, it's there's a subjectivity to it in terms of those bonus points and things. But the other is pretty direct in terms of something's either correct or incorrect. And at the end of the day, we, we grade that out and it requires a minimum score of 75 for a medium to pass. And that would be a combination of the percent accuracy. So the percent accuracy directly correlates to points. So if you're 65% accurate, that's 65 points. So the minimum that we would accept is 65% accuracy. Plus um, that person would have to have at least 10 bonus points to get to the 75 to pass. And that's graded over five readings. Now the indeterminable statements, we set those to the side because we really can't grade them as correct or incorrect. But if a medium exceeds 33% indeterminable statements, then we count anything over that as incorrect because that would be too high of a percentage of indeterminables to call that a good reading. And this is over the course of five readings, so it's the averages of those. And I will tell you that the top, probably the top 10 people in that have graded in the 90s, some in the mid to high 90s. So got some really talented people. A few have squeaked by, but everybody on the list has passed um, that, that scrutiny. So I think it's been pretty effective because over the course of the almost 10 years, I've only received one email from uh, someone who was unhappy with their reading and coming back to me about it. Yeah, and it is good to have a list of recommended people and you know that somebody has vetted them and can recommend them. It must put many people's minds at rest. I think so, yeah, because... Um, you know, people say, who should I go to? Uh, you know, I know some people who I haven't certified that are excellent. And, I, you know, I just haven't run them through the program because they don't have time. And to me, they, they don't need to. They've actually done, some of them have done blinded readings for me personally that were phenomenal. And I'll recommend those all day long. Um, or, you know, they may have a friend that says, oh, this medium did a great job for my friend. And then I'll ask them a few questions. And I'm like, that's fine to go to them. But, you know, how much did the medium know about them before they went? Um, and did they do it, you know, with video on and things like mm -hmm. that? Um, because really my process cuts out the possibility of cold reading, which is a lot of skeptic debunkers claim, oh, mediums all do cold reading. Well, that's not necessarily true. Um, it's, I don't think it is true for good mediums. And that's a process by which you would read expression, facial expressions and then get cues from someone as you're, and then you're refining your answers based on responses back. You're asking certain questions to lead it a certain way. So my process eliminates that possibility. So anyone you go to, even if they know who you are, I trust them. They've, they've done this and proven themselves. But, um, you know, if you do go to somebody, somebody else recommends, I'd ask more questions about the process and tell me more about the validations you got and how specific were they, you know, 
it's one thing to say, oh, your grandma's here and she loves you a lot. And if you're a 50 year old person, the odds are grandma's already on the other side, you know, yeah. and what grandma didn't love their grandkid, you know, so you need something meatier than that. Yeah. Yeah. What do you say? I mean, there are still many um, factions, many religions that actually demonize the practice. Um, what do you say to people like that? It's, it's interesting because it really goes back to my dad's world, too, because uh, he never really understood that angle because he felt like these were the gifts of the spirit that are talked about in the New Testament. First uh, Corinthians chapter 12, the gifts of the spirit. The Apostle Paul lists them all, and they're the same things. They're, you know, discerning of spirits and healing and, and all these kinds of things and prophecy. They're in there. Um, so what's it's not so much that Scripture, well, some of the Old Testament does um, stay, you know, puts down uh, the idea of contacting the dead or people who are deceased. But those are from chapters like Leviticus, Le Leviticus and Deuteronomy that also say things like, well, if you have a disobedient son, you should take him to a neighboring uh, city to be stoned to death. So, you know, is that really the word of God? Um, so I'll mention that. But then in the New Testament, these things are like all over the place. And even in the Old Testament, too, you've got the medium of Endor, who is cast as kind of a victim of Saul, who comes to her for information, even though he's outlawed this by decree. It said he put any mediums to death. Um, but he goes to a medium because he's lost his direct contact to God in his dreams and he's looking for direction. Um, but in the New Testament, you have all these kinds of things. You have Jesus uh, showing clairvoyance, talking to a woman at a well in the, in the Gospel of John, sharing details about her multiple husbands and things like that. And she says, surely, sir, you're a prophet. You have Jesus talking to dead people in the story of the transfiguration. Um so that's mediumship. If you're talking to people who are deceased, that's mediumship. And uh, so some people that are more of the fundamentalist variety of religion might say, well, that was Jesus. But the Gospel of John says, all the works I do, you shall do in greater works than these for who, those who believe in me. Um, so at the end of the day, I think that's more of a byproduct of what people have been taught traditionally or been uh, aligned to think with. And I think it really goes back to the Enlightenment period where church and science split apart after people like Galileo were <laughs> punished for no good reason for really figuring out how things work in terms of the solar system and being punished for that. And so since that void happened, science said, oh, your book says that all these miracle things happen, but nobody's doing that in your church today. Why is that? And instead of admitting that they kind of lost touch with the original uh, concept of people having those abilities and using them, they, they made an excuse and said, well, there was a special dispensation that happened back then, and it'll happen in the future, but right now nothing's happening. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where this comes from. Um, if people read the scripture themselves, instead of just taking what they're told at face value, they can kind of draw their own conclusions. And ultimately, I'd say, you know, a, a statement attributed to Jesus is, uh, a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Well, to me, it's good fruit if somebody gives a message to a despondent person that's on the verge of suicide because their kid passed and they have a sense of hope because of that. Isn't that good fruit? Yeah. And bearing that in mind, you uh, co-founded Healing Parents, um, Helping Parents Heal in 2011, an international organization that has over 26,000 members now, purely to help parents who were grieving, who'd lost children. Tell us a bit more about that organization. Yeah, the origins are kind of interesting, but back uh, after Soul Shift came out, a few years, within a year or so of that, I was doing some workshops with mediums um, and kind of sharing my dad's training materials and talking about my stories. And uh, at this one workshop, uh, a woman approached me and she said, hey, I'm a medium. I came here because I just moved from Florida to Arizona. I wanted to meet like-minded people. She said, but I, I met a woman who um, I read for, and her son also died on a mountain. Um, I just thought I'd mention that to you. And I said, you know what? Give her a copy of my book, Soul Shift, at the time. And here's my contact information. So if she wants to reach out to me, she can. So this woman, Suzanne Wilson, who's actually an excellent medium, she gave it to this other woman, Elizabeth Boyson. Within a day or two, I get this call from Elizabeth, and she said, hey, I read your book in one sitting. I want to meet you and your wife. So we met. And after a short period of talking, she said, you know what? 
I have this uh, Facebook group called Parents United in Loss, and I'm going to have my first ever in-person meeting um, next, you know, in a week or two. Would you be my first speaker? And I said, sure. So I went to that initial meeting. Uh, we had 30, 40 people there. It went well. And then Elizabeth started hosting these meetings every week. Fast forward to 2011, and I was changing jobs, uh, corporate jobs, and a medium friend of mine, Tina Power, said, Mark, I really think your mission in life is to help other parents who have been through the same thing you have. Maybe you could think about how to form an organization to do that. And so I thought, you know, why reinvent the wheel? Elizabeth's already doing that, but she's only one location. It's just one group. What if we took her idea or concept and blueprinted it and then spread it out and had other affiliate locations and we could start a newsletter and I could put together a website. So I approached her and with that and, uh, she says, oh, I love that. I'd be happy to do it. And I said, well, how about a new name to like Helping Parents Heal? She goes, oh, I love that name. Let's do that. And that's really the origin of it. And then we, some of the early members of the other meetings became board members of Helping Parents Heal. Um, and then we started getting setting up affiliates in other cities. And, and initially, Facebook was our method of just getting the word out. And then the thing just blew up. And in recent years, it's just exploded. We have 175 affiliates worldwide in a variety of countries, including the UK, uh, England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales. I don't know if we have some in Wales, but, um, and then even in India, all over the world. And um, some are you know, of other languages as well. We have 26,000 members worldwide, and we have a conference that we conduct every other year. The next one's gonna be in Phoenix, Arizona um, in August of 24, and we've we'll, it will hold a thousand people. We sold 750,000 registrations in the first couple of days. So I don't even know <laughs> if there's going to be any more room for folks. But that's the story of that. And really, the reason we exist is because we're the only organization that allows the open discussion of spiritual experiences and afterlife evidence. The other, at least the other groups in the U.S. don't allow that. They cut people off if they try and share that stuff. But we found that to be one of the most healing things of all, even more, you know, than therapy alone, or then, you know, having support from other people and things like that. But it's a real boost. And I've seen people come through that came in totally despondent and deeply depressed, who came out the other side of this highly functioning and able to experience joy again. Mm. What, are, what are the most important things you've learned about um, the process of healing grief? I've got what I call the five pillars of healing. And this is just from my observations. The first one is to have support from family and friends. Unfortunately, not everybody has that, but hopefully you do. And if you do have a loving family that's there for you, let them know that you want to talk about your child, that, you know, not to just try and sweep that under the rug because a lot of people are uncomfortable. They may do that. You want to talk about the happy memories. The second pillar is support from people who you meet who have been through the same thing because they can relate to you. And that's kind of where we can come in because we provide that platform for folks to meet others, especially in the conferences and this is even more critical for men because our, you know, our membership is probably 90% women. Men just kind of hide in a corner sometimes and they don't want to share their feelings or get involved. But during the conference, the women will bring their wives or partners, or boyfriends, and those men get mixed up in this. And they, they see that there's a change in them because they see the presentations. They, they, they meet other people. So that can be very helpful. The third pillar is pr to provide service something aside from yourself where you could help other people, whether that's doing meals on wheels for seniors or a soup kitchen or a foundation that does good work, or even setting up an affiliate chapter of our organization. When you give to others, it comes back to you. The fourth one is letting go of feelings of guilt. Cause a lot of parents will say, I should have done this. I could have done that. You know, just like I, my son, Brandon, if I had done something more to keep him from going that day, but at the end of the day, you can't control things like that. And, and you're not responsible. It's just the nature of the world we live in in life. Uh, you have to let go of that. And conversely, feelings of anger directed at others that you hold accountable, you've got to forgive. It's hard to do, but until you do, that's just hurting you. Yeah. And then the last pillar, the fifth pillar, is the one of hope. And that is openness to evidence for the afterlife. And for somebody who's been maybe an agnostic or whatever, or more fundamentals than religious beliefs, maybe it's opening your mind a bit and starting with some books about the kind of phenomena, whether they're books about NDEs like um, uh, Raymond Moody's books or Dr. Eben Alexander, or books about that deal more with mediumship like my books. 
you know, you could start there and then maybe you could do, figure out what you want to do. Maybe you get develop meditative practices for your direct connection. Maybe you want to see a good medium. Um, so those are the five things that I found in addition to therapy. Um, yeah, not saying that you don't need therapy, but in addition to uh, that have been most helpful to people. Well, that is a really hopeful note to end the show on. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for joining us and sharing your story with us. Of course. Thank you. So the persistence of the soul, mediums, spirit vid visitations and afterlife communication is published by Inner Traditions Bear and Company. For more information about Mark Ireland's books, events, his certified medium program and helping parents heal, visit his website at markirelandauthor.com. This show is available as a free downloadable podcast as well as a video um, on the Own Times website and on Spotify, iHeartRadio and all the major podcast platforms including Apple, Google, Amazon and Audible. So you can download it and listen to it at your leisure. That's it for this week. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer. I'll be back with another edition of What Is Going On at the same time next week. Till then, it's goodbye from me and thank you to Mark Ireland. Sure.